Today we speak about uh, cultural participation and uh, its impact on uh, individual uh, and social change. It's a topic that has been uh, widely disregarded for uh, quite a long time. And the reason is that uh, more generally cultural participation is uh, heavily overlooked as a policy variable and more generally as a driver of uh, relevant uh, policy implications, because generally there has been an identification between uh, cultural participation and uh, leisure and free time activities. And uh, in our own uh, vision of the hierarchy of uh, relevance of priorities of uh, various aspects of human existence, uh, participation uh, as related to, to leisure tends to be something minor, even marginal, because of course there is a much stronger, uh, much, much stronger emphasis that is placed generally on issues that have to do with uh, clearly identified uh, survival needs or more generally uh, challenges that really have to do with uh, human well-being. Well, it's a uh, it's important to stress in the first place that uh, in some sense, uh, leisure is far from being a minor uh, concern in itself uh, for uh, human well-being and more generally for human quality of life. But the point is that uh, culture goes much beyond the uh, simple and immediate relationship with, uh, with uh, leisure. And uh, it has to do uh, very profoundly with uh, aspects that uh, relate to the most important dimensions of uh, human uh, activity and more generally our capacity to adapt to environments. So from this point of view, it's extremely important to stress that uh, a new paradigm for uh, cultural policy intervention can really be based on uh, the mounting acknowledgement that is emerging also from both from the scientific literature and from policy experimentation about the effectiveness of uh, cultural activities and even uh, specifically designed interventions to foster uh, aspects uh, of uh, behavioral change that are particularly important for societal challenges. So where does this come from? I mean, why there is a relationship that is much more profound and elusive between uh, human behavior and culture that we commonly maintain. Well, the point is that uh, we have a profound uh, uh, misunderstanding of uh, how our own, uh, let's say, perceptual and decision-making systems function in the first place. We tend to think, for example, that activities like mind-wandering and daydreaming are activities that are, again, in some, somehow related to leisure, uh, activities that are minor, that are not particularly important in defining, for example, our own um, activity, our own mental states, and so on. Sometimes we, we think we exceptionally engage in uh, imagination and daydreaming when we have some spare time and we are not particularly absorbed by day-to-day -day activities and cores. But the problem is that, uh, in fact, uh, neuroscience research shows us very clearly that uh, daydreaming and mind-wandering is something we fall back into any time we are not directly engaged in the uh, daytime activities, so to speak, activities that really cater our uh, uh, attention and skills for uh, specific goals in a specific here and now. So tendentially, uh, we humans tend to fall back a state of mind wandering and imagination whenever we are not engaged directly into something else. This really means that in some sense, uh, mind wandering is our own default state. And this seems very, very strange, very problematic. Why should we by default be, uh, let's say, uh, immersed in this uh, mind wandering and daydreaming we, while we are not attending to anything specifically. Well, the reason is that uh, the role of imagination and uh, the role of uh, mental simulation of activities plays a much more substantial uh, part 
of our own capacity to adapt to environments that, that we tend to suspect. First of all, uh, we know that uh, our own activities during our uh, conscious uh, aware experience that is goal directed to practical goals tends to be regulated by a complex hardware in our brains, which is, which is our set of mental maps. We have mental maps for vision, for movement, for recognition, for a complex coordination of various sensory inputs and so on and so forth. And uh, these are indispensable for our functioning as humans. But the point is that the same kind of hardware, exactly the same kind of hardware is involved in imagery and more generally in imagination and daydreaming. So when we think of, for example, wandering through, let's say a grass expanse among the mountains. And so we, we think of us walking there, actually the same brain maps that are activated in our, in our brain are the same that we use to actually walk in these particular environments. And the same, of course, when we have uh, some uh, social relationship with people, imagining social relationships or remembering past social relationships actually activates the same brain areas that we actually engage with during uh, real social interaction. So what does this imply? Well, it implies that uh, these forms of uh, imagery are actually forms of simulation. And this simulation is particularly important. Why? Because uh, the problem is that uh, when we engage in a real uh, life activities, these activities are generally more or less high stakes kind of activities. There are situations where making mistakes is costly. For example, if you just meet somebody you never met before, and if this somebody has, uh, for example, some intentions toward you, for example, he's a potential boss and you are at a work interview, trying to figure out what your boss has, a potential boss has in mind when uh, he or she asks you a particular question at the interview, job selection interview. I mean, understanding what's going on in that particular situation is clearly a high stakes situation. Whether or not you get a job can really depend on how correctly you read the particular intentions and the particular motivations and the particular expectations your potential boss is, uh, is nurturing when making you, when, uh, when questioning you in certain ways. So if you make a mistake in that particular situation, that's very costly. You, you, you of course, uh, face the prospect of not getting the job. Um, and uh, more generally, this happens most of the time. So it's very important that in our uh, goal-directed uh, daytime activity, uh, in some sense, uh, we learn how to react to the environment properly in ways that are, uh, let's say, as aligned uh, in terms of expectations versus reality as we can imagine, which means that we are harnessing for example, our uh, brain and more generally our neural system as a prediction machine. We are trying really to predict what's going on. And uh, this prediction, for example, in social interaction has to do also with uh, mind reading, uh, understanding the psychology of other people. So what kind of uh, advantage imagination and daydreaming can provide to you in situations like those? Well, one of the most interesting examples that we can make in this regard has to do with fictional narratives. So fictional narratives are uh, imaginary situations, situations that never happened. Even when a fiction resembles or uh, recalls uh, actual historical facts, like for example, a fictionalized biography, let's say of Napoleon or whoever, in some sense, that's fiction. Uh, that's not an accurate description of events unless it's a really accurate historical uh, research. But most, of course, of the accounts that we are interested in and we access uh, uh, concerning historical events are fictionalized ones, not to speak of narratives that are uh, from the outset uh, conceived as entirely fictional, as something that has no pretense of representing real events.
So in this specific situation, so what is, what's the use of this? Why are we as humans so absorbed into this uh, strange stories that have uh, clearly no real counterpart? Well, we know today that uh, the reason why we are so absorbed is that they are extremely powerful social simulations. The stories we really like are not just every kind of story, but the stories in which uh, the characters and the situation they are engaged with are particularly, let's say, attractive, are particularly engaging. And this is to do not necessarily on how realistic the setting is, the story could be something about, uh, let's say, time travel or uh, worlds uh, which are completely, uh, I mean, uh, fictional, like uh, fantasy novels, for example. But nevertheless, if the psychological dilemmas that the characters have to face are uh, interesting and, uh, let's say, realistic enough from our own perspective, we are very much absorbed into them because we recognize that they carry a substantial value of social cognition. By being absorbed in these stories, it's like we are extending in a very effective and profound way our own experience beyond what we can experience directly. It's like living several lives at once and learning from all those lives, especially when as I said, the fictional uh, environment is uh, rich and re realistic, psychologically realistic enough to make it worthwhile uh, and to consider this as a parallel experience, as a parallel world we are immersed in. So in this particular regard, uh, accessing a fictional narrative uh, extends in a dramatically positive way for example, our capacity to read the minds of other humans in realistic situations. Think, for example, of the exceptional success, even after centuries, of the novels of Jane Austen. I mean, this could seem, uh, I mean, puzzling because clearly the stories and the characters of Jane Austen have to do with a completely different society and have to do with uh, issues that at face value are completely different than the one that the average reader is facing today, even in romantic relationships. But what is really interesting about Jane Austen is this capacity of just uh, toggling in and out the minds of the specific characters and really open up to us certain types of thought and decision processes in ways that are so exceptionally detailed and careful that uh, really uh, we, we, we feel these characters are alive in some sense. They are still, although they are so remote from us in space and time, they, they, they are alive and they are teaching us lessons that are absolutely worthwhile to listen to. So from this point of view, and this of course holds for uh, the so many different narratives that have gone through ages and uh, just repeated and transmitted from generation to generation, thanks to this uh, superior ability to, 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 to show us um, some uh, profound aspects of human nature, of human thinking, of human reasoning that are uh, so useful still today in our own uh, daily interaction. So although this could sound uh, very utilitarian and shallow, of course, literature and the wonders of the enchantment of literature goes much beyond the simple practical lessons that we can draw from them. But uh, it's very important to understand that these lessons really have to do with the, the, all, the, the, the complexity of the whole simulation uh, world that uh, the narrative puts together. So we are not simply eager to listen to the narratives because we extract dryly just the life lessons from there, but because we really learn from all kinds of details, uh, paying attention to single uh, nuances of the stories of the environment or to simple signals uh, coming from characters of certain crucial passages and so on and so forth. So what I'm saying is not that we use this uh, again in a very straightforward and a utilitarian way to extract lessons, but uh, in some sense, uh, we draw the same kind of insight and the uh, teachings from this experience as 
we do from our own life experiences in the environments we are living in. So that's uh, the reason why fiction is so important, is really living several parallel lives at the same time, and in particular, exploring conditions that we could not access directly to our own direct experience, but at the same time could be extremely useful, I mean, uh, in uh, situations that we are not facing yet. So uh, this has created a real craving for narrative that has become so evident today and so widely studied also, for example, by behavioral sciences and also so common in our own everyday experience. And this also just explains the success, for example, new platforms like um, Netflix and other uh, platforms that provide the unlimited access to all kinds of possible, for example, movie narratives that we are so eager to, to spend time on. And this is just an example, but uh, as a general rule, we, we, we could say that even experiences that are less uh, directly related to, uh, to uh, stories in the literal sense, like for example, in the case of music or the visual arts, in some sense, uh, harness uh, similar uh, abilities and the development of similar skills that have to do with uh, uh, improving the adaptive performance, for example, of our neural systems to the environment we live in. The point is that all the kind of experiences that we build through cultural participation then actually reflect in very powerful way in our attitudes. We change our behavior as a consequence of this. And it's not, uh, for example, it's not uh, um, trivial to consider that even the metaphors that we use, for example, to describe phenomena of behavioral change, sometimes have to do with the topoi, with situations that are typical of narratives. For example, today we tend to disregard romantic narratives because we think they are cheesy, they are not particularly realistic and so on and so forth. But still today, when we, want to really endorse uh, something new and uh, adopt something new, a new course of action, a new, a new idea, we tend to use the metaphor of marrying. We marry a new idea. For example, the difference between marrying an idea, an idea and buying an idea. I buy an idea means that I am just uh, subscribed to that idea, but I could change my mind anytime because uh, it's just, okay, you have convinced me now, but uh, who knows what happens next? If I marry an idea, I'm saying that I'm really endorsing this idea to the level to being faithful to this idea, potentially even along my lifetime. So this kind of uh, metaphors, this kind of uh, intuitions that we are deriving from our own experience of uh, fictional words and more generally cultural participation and their reflex on behavioral change are incredibly powerful. So the fact that we are cultivating our imagination and daydreaming through cultural participation is not a futile dimension of our experience, as we have always thought for centuries and sometimes in a very misleading way. It's a crucial skills building that is fundamental for our adaptive response to societal challenges, both individually and socially, and not incidentally, of course, the social relevance of narratives and more generally, the social relevance of uh, shared imaginations is so important in shaping collective behaviors. So it's extremely important for us to understand that by unleashing the potential of cultural participation, we are also creating the premises for potential interventions aimed at behavioral change that are probably even more powerful than the ones currently fashionable today, like nudging experiences and nudging experiments. The point is that uh, the problem is not simply change. The problem is lasting behavioral change. So if we really want people to stick, for example, to a certain course of action, like, for example, in improving their, uh, let's say, pro-social orientation towards uh, sustainable, ecologically sustainable behaviors, the problem is not manipulating their emotions in the here and now. The problem is creating a permanent change of orientation. And this is not possible by simply acting on the local architecture of choice of one specific situation as it's commonly done in experiments and uh, for example, in nudging interventions. 
but really has to do with reshaping the vision, reshaping uh, our own identification with certain issues. And this is much more effectively carried out through our own immersive experience of the words of meaning that have to do with imagination and cultural participation. So we are still at the beginning of this uh, experimentation on how cultural participation can really support the ambitious programs of behavioral change for the social good and for the public interest. But the point is that we are not reinventing the wheel. I mean, it's always been like this. It's always been that culture has supported the, this individual and collective phenomenon of behavioral change in our long evolutionary history as humans. The point is that we have basically disregarded this possibility in the last few centuries when we have uh, increasingly regarded culture as a specialized elite activity. But if we recover the original meaning and stance of culture, its role in the human affairs, as it appears also in uh, societies before the diffusion of writing technology itself, then in some sense, we are simply recovering something that has been deeply inbuilt in our own human nature. And uh, this, of course, shows very clearly in the strength of the neural signatures of the neural correlates of, uh, of cultural activity that we are rediscovering today. So I think that we are at the beginning of a very exciting cycle of research and experimentation. And I really hope that these uh, perspectives and ideas will be fertile in terms of stimulating further research and experimentation. And I look forward also to the experiences that uh, the participants to this uh, summer school can also bring to the fore to discuss more in depth these perspectives. Thank you very much for your attention.